Okay. Everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Cool. Um, well, thank you for being here during, I think, lunchtime. So really appreciate that. So really hope you get some value out of this, this talk. Um, so I'm Ricky Burke, and we're here to talk about brute force your job application. So just to sort of kick things off, I'm from Australia, uh, or at least the last 10 years living in Australia. Um, yesterday I was outside um, doing my presentation document and someone saw a B-Sides t-shirt that I was wearing and said, oh, which B-Sides is that from? And I said, B-Sides Brisbane. And then they looked at me, like I said, Mars. So Brisbane, it's Australia, it's a far place. Um, we're famous for sharks, famous for winning medals in the swimming at Olympics, surfing, kangaroos, bluey, which I believe is pretty popular over here. And I saw gets over a billion uh, minutes played per week in the US alone, which is amazing. Uh, drop bears, we're famous for. Bin chickens, also known as ibis. And we're a pretty big country. Um, so we're about 78% the size of the US in terms of land mass. But we're a tiny country in terms of population. So we're about 7, 8% the size of the US. But we love cybersecurity. We've got a very vibrant cybersecurity community. So I'm very proud to be here today because I've been here for three years in a row uh, doing resume reviews. I love doing community stuff. And um, honestly, very happy to, to participate, hopefully again, offer some value. And, Again, this is B-Size Las Vegas, the original. Um, in Australia, we've got six this year, um, one of which I think competes size-wise. We've got one of 3,000 people. So if you ever want a technical conference in Australia, B-Size Canberra is a pretty good one to go to. Although outside of that, there's maybe not much to do in Canberra. So I'm Ricky Burke. Um, I run a cybersecurity recruitment company. Um, yes, as, as Kirsten said, recruiters can be evil. Um, I try not to be one of those. Um, so I've been running a cybersecurity cyber recruitment business for over seven years. Uh, recently, Soft launched a cybersecurity careers platform to try and help, help people get into this space because, quite frankly, a lot of people need help. And I love to do the community stuff. So I'm very lucky and fortunate to run career villages back in Australia. Um, so B-Size Canberra, Melbourne and a bunch of other things. This year I'm speaking here, I'm speaking at Black Hat tomorrow. and. As a recruiter, I can't help every person find a job directly, but we can help in other ways. And that's what we're about. So today is about empowering you with information, with tactics, with strategies, with information, not just here's some resume tips and do these three things and you'll get a job because it's way beyond that. Um, but if we can help you with the tools, the strategies, techniques, not just today, but for the rest of your career. Hopefully that will help you stand out whenever you're applying for a job and hopefully jobs will come to you as well. So talking of jobs, because it's a pretty important topic, um, job hunting. Can we raise a hand if job hunting sucks? Okay, I think nearly everyone, so let's, we're on the same page. So the agenda today, we're going to go through a few different things. First is what I call the foundational building. So we'll talk about essentially identifying what you want to do in your career, what's the next step, and having a deeper think about really what you bring to the table for employers. Building a brand. I hate, hate, hate that term. Um, if anybody has a better term, please let me know because it sucks. It sounds really cheesy, but essentially I want to talk about building brand. Resumes also suck, but they are important because realistically without them, you won't get most jobs. Proactive job hunting is something I'm very passionate about. Again, this goes to, you can't, we, I can't help every single person apply to for a job, but if I can teach you how to apply and different techniques, then you can help yourself. Interview, interview preparation is really important and then navigating job offers. So we'll go through this life cycle of basically job, well, looking for a job to in a job and hopefully jobs coming to you in the future. So identifying career goals is important. Um, just as out of interest, I'm curious, I guess, our audience stage in your career, who is either looking for their first job or near looking for their first job or 
at the early stage of their career in cybersecurity. Okay, and who's already in the industry and maybe looking for progression in the near future? Okay, that's that's really helpful. So that helps me narrow what I talk about and expand what I talk about. So for some of you folks, you're already in the industry, you know what you're doing, and maybe you, you know what you want to do next. For those early in their career, I tend to find there's a very similar conversation, people coming to me with, I want to get into cyber. They don't realize that cybersecurity is made up of lots of different jobs, that it requires lots of different skill sets. So it's really important that if you know the job you want to work in, then you can work backwards in terms of what skills you need to acquire to basically be useful in a job. Also, understand the job market. So again, I can reflect on my experience in Australia, but I'm sure there'll be similarities here as well. Is As an example, I'll speak to someone, and I've had this conversation the last few months, they want to be a malware analyst. It's their passion, they love going deep diving into malware, but then there's no jobs for a malware analyst, unless you want to work in government. Australia is a really low maturity level for certain types of niche roles out there, and this is one of those. And the same goes wherever you may live in your town, city or state, that you may want a certain type of role. But if that job isn't out there, then you have to be realistic of what else is out there as well. Um, so there might be jobs, but maybe not the jobs that you actually want to work in. And then we'll go through developing the skills to help you stand out. So this goes, that first question is, what do you want to do? That's really for the people trying to break into this industry of understanding, do you want to be a pen tester? Do you want to be an application security engineer? Do you want to be an architect? All different skill sets that essentially require different type of skills. You can't just, I just want to get my foot in the door and make that work. You need to bring something to the table. Ultimately, it's about solving problems. And the quicker you can identify the ability to solve certain types of problems because you bring experience or skills to the table, the more chance you have of actually landing a job. <coughs> so this is the big thing, again, I know we've got some experienced folks here, but just for the more junior people out there, is you can't rely on, I just wanna get into cyber, because it is, is a big field, big industry, lots of jobs. We don't help ourselves with job titles either, um, because you can work in a consultancy, in professional services, as a security consultant. But there'll be people that are pen testers and GRC consultants. They could be further from the truth or further from each other, but they're working in different jobs, but same job title. And security engineer as well. You need to look at a job title that says security engineer, but really understand what are they trying to achieve here? Because is it a cloud security engineer role? Is it application security? Is it network security? In some of the tech companies, some of the red teamers or pen testers have security engineer as their title as well. So we're really, bad in this industry with job titles. So I think really important is to understand the underlying context of that. Now, question, and I appreciate um, Kirsten's gonna be a runner here. Um, it must sound really simple and basic, but why do companies hire people in the first place? If anyone has an answer, please raise your hand if you're not shy. <laughs> yeah, like you said earlier, to solve a problem. I gave it away, didn't I? <laughs> um, spot on. Um, it's to solve a problem. And we get caught up, I think, when applying for jobs of, we'll cover resumes later on because most people's resumes are garbage. Um, but essentially, companies don't, if we just focus on cybersecurity, they're not spending millions of dollars in cyber because they want to. But no, no business spends money because they want to. They spend it because they either have to or there's rules and regulations in place. And essentially, it's to solve certain types of problems. And if you understand the underlying context of the problem you're trying to solve, because even if we look at, say, an application security engineer, the role isn't just to do certain types of activities in terms of securing the SDLC pipelines and um, threat modeling and things like that. But if you take a step back and understand, well, what, what are we trying to achieve here? It's about essentially helping developers do secure code. And there's lots of different activities then to work towards that, but there's different skill sets that you need. And this is the, this is the issue with cyber. People look at it, I know it's more mature now, but it's still an, a niche industry. I know for us folk here, and there's thousands here, and there's gonna be even more at DEF CON and Black Hat. Um, it's still a niche industry by other standards. 
But then within that, there's so many niches in this space that ultimately it's about what you bring to the table, what problems can you solve? And then during this application process, when you're applying for jobs, it's your ability to communicate how can you solve certain types of problems. So this is the issue for a lot of people, is you'll be one side, the job is the other side, and often there is a skills, knowledge, or experience gap. The sooner you can identify to an employer, or potential employer, what you bring to the table, so what skills, what knowledge, what experience, what problems you can solve, you stand out so easy. And when we talk about solving problems, for me, it's, it's understanding business context and coming to the table with, again, understanding the underlying foundations of why the role exists and then demonstrating to them what outcomes you can do. And when you can convert that into metrics, numbers, outcomes, you show that you're thinking on a very different wavelength to a lot of other people out there. Um, so where possible is you try and convert things into metrics, into numbers, into percentages, saving money, saving time, the two biggest assets out there. But also it helps you identify, so you might be here today, the job that you want is over here. Do you know what the skills gap is? So as an example, let's pretend you could be someone who's early in your career or you're looking to go from one level to another. So it doesn't really matter whether you're looking for your first job in cyber or whether you're a CISO looking for the next executive leadership role. There might be a gap there. And your job is to understand what is that gap and what do you need to do to bridge that gap. So if I simplify things a bit more, let's pretend I'm an application security engineer and I want to be the engineering manager now. That's my next step. You don't have the experience yet, so that's your gap. But what can you bring to the table that helps validate that you can do that? So if you don't know that, the easiest thing you can do is then having a network, having relationships, having people out there that you can talk to. So LinkedIn is a very powerful thing to use. And I think people, admittedly, LinkedIn is just a glorified recruitment platform. And then it masquerades as social uh, business networking, but it is just a recruitment platform but you can network with people out there. So if you basically reach out to a whole bunch of people that work in the job that you want to work in, connect with them, start asking them questions. There are so many amazing people in this industry that will help you. So if you reach out to 20 people, not maybe not every single one of them, but the vast majority of them will respond to you and will offer you help. Because essentially people love helping each other in this space. So if you're asking someone, what skills do you use? How did you get in that position? You'll find common themes in terms of the skill sets, the experiences, what that person did, and now you know what you need to work towards to bridge that gap and make your job a lot easier landing that, that next job. Again, I hate this word, brand. Um, does anyone have a better phrase? No. Profile. I did have profile on there, but I deleted it. Pardon? Repl oh, I like that. Okay, I might use that next time, thank you. So this is what I think of when I think about brand. It's like TikTok influencers and just, just shit, to be honest with you. Um, this is how I feel inside every time I hear the word brand. Um, so I will start using reputation. So building a reputation, I love it. Why? Okay, so here's an example. I, I got a really nice intro, so thank you for that earlier. Um, I'm here from Australia. Why the hell is someone from Australia traveling 30 hours door to door to come and speak to folks in the US? Um, I'm pretty lucky that I've managed to build a reputation. Um, that sounds wanky. Um, so on, on LinkedIn, I'm pretty active. I've got 40,000 followers, which is okay. There's plenty more people out, people out there with bigger following than me. Um, but ultimately, I think I do pretty well on LinkedIn. I'm very lucky where I've built a business that essentially, you know, we generate seven figure revenues every year and we're not a traditional recruitment company. We're not doing the usual sales crap that a lot of recruiters do. We're not, we're not doing those same tactics. A lot of things come to us because of reputation. So in terms of the things we give back to the industry, in terms of the help that we give people, in terms of just consistently delivering, those things matter. And again, just reflecting back on the original slide here is all of this stuff is because seven, eight years ago, I just 
I, if I'm honest with you, I never intended to build a brand or reputation. I just wanted to get involved in the industry because it seemed fun. And I'm very lucky that I got to speak at something, then got to speak at another thing and things keep growing. Now I'm running career villages at conferences and doing different stuff. So these, these things do take time. And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for all the stuff that I've done for seven plus years in the industry. But ultimately it's about building trust, building awareness. There's a lot of charlatans out there and there'll be people out there that essentially do things for the wrong reasons. I think what is good the majority of the time, this community is really good at calling bullshit and people that are very um, self-serving get found out, not all the time, but they do get found out. But this is why I think building a reputation is helpful because if people trust you, if they have that awareness, first of all, jobs come to you. And let's be honest, we've said job hunting sucks. Applying for a job online sucks. Um, when you go online, you see a job that you like, you go through the process, you fill in the details of just either submitting or you fill in these horrible platforms like Workday um, and it just disappears into a black hole. And sometimes you never hear back from the, the company. And it's, and it's demoralizing. It's not a fun process. And what's a lot nicer is if jobs come to you, if you're being approached for jobs and essentially you don't have to look for jobs because your brand, your reputation is working for you in the world. And essentially, again, people trust you, they like you. I wanna work with that person and jobs will come to you. So that's really helpful. Opportunities like presenting at conferences, the more you do things and if it goes well, when people get value out of it, the more you get. And again, the more you give, the more you get. But you don't do it to get back. You just give and hopefully people like it and hopefully it works. But essentially, it's not a bad thing at all if you give back and people get value out of that. That's a nice win-win scenario for everybody. When you're a manager, it's a lot easier to hire people if they know you. Um, so there'll be hiring managers out there that Essentially, they have a job, they post it on LinkedIn and people come to them because they know this person and they want to work for that person. There'll be other hiring managers out there that have no brand, no reputation, no awareness, and they might post a job, but no one sees it because they don't have the network, they don't have the credibility, they don't have the trust. So not just from that perspective of about jobs in the future, but also potentially as a hiring manager, if you have people coming to you when it's a very challenging environment to hire good people, then that's a lot easier to, as well. The bigger the network, the more things come to you. So there's the old saying that it's not what you know, it's who you know, but it's also who knows you. And it's just, again, things are a lot easier if more people know you. And then again, the opportunity to give back. It sounds cheesy, but honestly, it feels good. Um, if you know that people get value out of essentially advice and insights that you, that you basically offer, <coughs> it feels weird or, or cheesy, but honestly, it feels really good to make a difference. Um, I, I've done a ton of stuff over the years and things that I even forget sometimes. Then I, I get people reach out to me and say, hey, that thing you did three years ago, I followed your advice and got a job. It's like, cool, I never knew that. Like, you, you never know how many people that you actually are impacting, but to get those bit of feedback every now and again, like you know that it's working and you know that people are getting value and that's, that's really important. Also, it's fun. Um, I'm very fortunate where I can go to a conference in Australia now, most conferences, and I don't even need to talk to anyone because fortunately they'll come to me because LinkedIn and it helps. Honestly, I, in my job and in my capacity, I, I meant to be an extrovert, I'm not. I feel so bloody uncomfortable walking around a room, even worse with masks, and you can't recognize each other. It's really awkward. I don't feel super comfortable walking around a room and just going, hey, I'm Ricky, what do you do? Um, some people do and fair play to them. And that in itself, if you can build that tolerance, that skill, because um, it is like anything, it's like a muscle, um, it's a very powerful thing because you'll see people out there and there'll be someone sitting on their laptop, sitting on their phone. It looks like they're busy. Basically they're lonely because maybe they're in the same position as you. And just a really quick tip that I use myself because I went to a conference in Switzerland recently, did not know a single person and I, I felt super uncomfortable. So I set myself some just small goals. So in the morning, speak to three people. 
And the way I would do that is I would look for other people on their own as well. It wouldn't always go to plan, but essentially look for someone else on their own because maybe they're like me and they don't know anyone else as well. And the ideal thing is when you're in a queue for food, because essentially no one's going anywhere. You're, you're behind each other and you can say, oh, hey, like, what do you do? Or how's the conference? Just open questions. How's the conference? Or what have you seen today? Who, who did you see? Um, and then, oh, what do you do? And it just flows from there. But open questions are really, really important. So if, if you don't know open questions, who, what, when, why, how? Um, if you ask a closed question, you're tempted to get a closed answer. Did you have a good conference today? Yes. Cool. Or how was the conference? It was really good. Now you can expand the conversation. And honestly, you just never know where these things land. I know people that have met their partner at a conference. There are a ton of people that, that get jobs from conferences. And maybe the goal isn't, I have to land the job. That's too much pressure. But it's just starting small. But if you can, again, set a small goal, a few questions, then you go, cool, I achieved that goal. Then in the afternoon, I'm going to try for five people. And then every person you speak to, say, hey, are you on LinkedIn? Yes, I am. Or are you on Twitter or X? Um, oh, do you mind if I send you a connection? Yeah, no problem. If you do that every time you go to an event, a meetup, a conference, that compounded over a period of time really, really helps. Because this industry is such a small place and you just never know where these things are going to take you. And you may bump into someone that may be able to refer you to a, a job in the future or you just might meet some friends or you just may never speak to them again. But ultimately, the more people that know you, the easier life is. So building a reputation. So I'm going to be really honest, you know, what I'm very lucky that I've you know, got this thing on LinkedIn, but I never did it with any intentions and I didn't follow these steps. It's now that I look at what I've done or what other people do, reflect on that and go, right, this, if I was going to start from zero, this is how I would do it today. So define your target audience. So I had a really good conversation with a CISO last week. We were talking about the same sort of thing. And his agenda or his target audience would look very different from someone who's maybe looking for their first job in cyber. Now, from his perspective, he, he's not looking right now, but he's thinking six months, 12 months, 24 months. He's thinking about his next, uh, next role in the future. Ultimately, the more people he has at the level that essentially would hire him, the better it is for him. So for him, he needs more people like CTOs, CEOs, um, C-level people. He needs to be connected with those. Because if he connects with all these people, he then shares content that is valuable for these people and they get insights and they like what he puts out there then when they have a job at that level, who are they gonna to go to? If this person's in front of mind because they keep posting good stuff, they go, I like this person and they're sharing good info, I would, I would like to work with them. He's gonna get reached out to by potentially that company as opposed to apply for a job and trust me, leadership roles are really hard to attain as well. So even though these folks are at the top and they're CISOs and they're the top of the tree in terms of cybersecurity roles, it is so challenging for the C-level people either to get that first job or even to get the next job because competition is so high. A huge percentage of the industry want those jobs. Um, so again, it doesn't matter what level you are, but if jobs come to you, it's so much easier. But then you've got the content type. So you've got, well, some people like writing things. Some people like sharing photos. Some people like doing different things. Honestly, it doesn't really matter what. I think just work to whatever you're comfortable and then go from there. Um, and it gets really tricky of like, well, what do I post? And we'll touch on that as well. But essentially work to a medium that you're comfortable. You don't have to do something you don't want to. Like I do videos sometimes, but then I go through phases where I do not want to put myself through it. Um, you know, sometimes in the flow and I'll do a video one take, sometimes it takes me 20. And that's stressful in itself. But the interesting thing is the algorithms change all the time with LinkedIn and platforms like that, where if I'm honest with you, I think written content with no pictures works really well at the moment. So at other times you'll get recommendations of a picture and other stuff and whatever, but 
if you just speak to what's true to you, then you're more, I think, mindful that it will come through as more natural rather than just trying to force something as well. And then the consistency. Um, I'll, I'll hold my hand up. I don't have a content calendar. I just make shit up and just do it on the fly. But I'm so in a rhythm that I tend to post. I looked at my stats recently and I've posted 365 posts in the last 12 months. So unintentionally, I posted a post a day, but sometimes it was three or four, four posts one day and then nothing for four or five days. Um, but if the average person starting out was at zero and you want to get somewhere, two, three posts a week would be really good. And then you think, well, how the hell do I do that many posts? What do I post about? Well, we can talk about that as well. Um, but if you, for example, set time aside where it's just to take some pressure off an hour a week and you think, well, I'm going to do a few posts this week um, and then spend some time figuring out what those posts may be. You can schedule posts on LinkedIn as well. So you can then go, right, for this hour, I'm just going to work out what I'm going to do for the week, schedule the posts, and then you don't have to worry about anything. So just set and forget, and then you're good. Um, and then the engagement is really important as well. So it's not just about posting. It's about connecting. It's about commenting on other people's posts. If you see something, and don't just comment for the sake of it because you'll just sound like an idiot. But if you actually see something where, oh, that's really interesting, and just comment, oh, really, you know, good post or good research or offer insights or offer more you know, content, apparently, and this is a thing I picked up recently, if you comment over, I think, I think it's 12 words on a comment, then you're more likely to get more interactions, and that's an algorithm thing on LinkedIn. So again, being mindful of playing the game as well of LinkedIn. So the rules change, but if you get an idea of how they work, that's pretty helpful as well. And then collaboration. So if you see people that like things that you like and share ideas, you can do podcasts, you can do posts. Um, Kirsten tagged me into a photo earlier, collaboration. I will take that, I will then take that to LinkedIn, I will then do, the, do likewise, and then we're helping each other unintentionally, but that's what happens. So your network grows through other people as well. You of course have to be mindful that you don't wanna do that with the wrong people, so do your research. Um, but essentially, you can help each other build your brand, um, and again, that sucks saying that, but it helps. Um, but also, going back to that first thing of um, connections, Basically, be very intentional about the community or the, the, the type of people you'll be connecting with. So it could be just people, you know, let's pretend I'm a pen tester and I just want to connect with other pen testers because well, why not? I can learn from other people. I can connect with other people. We can share ideas. That's really cool. If your intention is I want to land a job, well, you probably need to know more people at the next level or level higher that hire for the role that you do. So send connection requests. Uh, what works really well? And apparently you get a higher hit rate if you send no message. But if I talk about my experience, I've got thousands of connection requests. Most of them have no uh, message. But if, you, if someone wants to send a message to me and say, hey, Ricky, I enjoyed your presentation at B-Size Las Vegas, or I saw you over there, or I enjoyed this thing, uh, it'd be great to connect. I'm so much more likely to connect with someone because there are people out there that won't connect with someone they've never met before. But if you offer to say, hey, I read your book, I saw your news article, or uh, I read some research that you did three years ago, like that's personal. The more personal you make it, the more likely you'll be in terms of getting those connections, which helps. And this is really, really important, is, is not try not to make it about you. Um, a good example is let's use recruiters. Um, if you look at, look at most recruiters on LinkedIn or Twitter, Twitter's the worst when you see it, is when they just post jobs. That's it. Like there's no advice, there's no insights, there's, there's nothing. All it is is just posting jobs. All they're looking for is people to respond. Basically, they're just asking rather than giving. So if you can share insights, if you can share advice, if you can share opinions, People get to know you, the human, behind the job title. And that's really, really important. And people may think, well, I'm 16 years old. Um, we have, sorry to point you out, I met, a, are you still 16? 
I met, I won't say your name just in case you don't like public stuff. 16 year old at B-Sides Barcelona a few months ago. And like one, it's unusual to meet teenagers, no offense, at a conference. And then for, to him talk about the research that he was doing, I was like, shit, this, this kid, kid, I'm sorry, but technically you still are. Um, uh, it's impressive, genuinely impressive. And then he said he was going to DEF CON and B-Size Las Vegas. I was like, who does that? And that's just amazing. And then you, I gave you advice about building your LinkedIn, sharing insights, like sharing photos and sharing things. And ultimately it helps build your network. So again, you don't make it about you, but you make it about sharing, giving back. Cause there might be other people that, that you're going through the same sort of things. But again, the point I'm getting at is you might be, no offense, 16 or you might be 30 or 50 or whatever and think i don't know what value i offer um i've never worked in this job before how the hell can i provide value to other people well the thing is you can document your journey you can talk about going through things like starting out in bug bounties you could start talk about going through hack the box you can talk about different things just document your journey because other people will be at a different point and might find it interesting or they might learn from you or you might get other people go, oh, I respect that. That person's trying. And they might come and then give you advice as well. But essentially, you never make it about you. You try and just offer things for other people that hopefully, again, they get value out of. And this can work really well. Like If you have no ideas what to post, just use what's out there. You don't have to be original. You don't have to create things and be, oh, I'm going to be a thought leader. Um, basically, First of all, just Google news. I'm just going to Google some hacking stories or this company got breached last week. Um, or you might find some interesting research topics or a blog or something like that. <coughs> a good, uh, well, I like to think a good example is this. So, um, so I'm showing my whole screen here. Um, so, if I'm honest with you, this is what I did many years ago, because I'll be honest, I, was, I felt very intimidated. Um, I went to my first security meetup as a recruiter. I went to a really technical meetup with just a bunch of hackers. And I was thinking to myself, what the hell am I doing here? Like everyone else is like elite hacker. And then there's me. I don't know shit. But what's really weird is people can be really nice. I went and spoke to the, the organizer. Three years later, I'm going to his wedding. Like, this industry is weird in a good way. But then in terms of posting content, again, I just went looking for interesting things. That I thought, oh, that's cool. And what's really cool is I know a friend of mine did a red team engagement using a tool that I found on Reddit. So I posted something on LinkedIn because I just went looking for just, they've changed this from, from a few years ago, but essentially I just went looking for something interesting. I would look for the amount of comments or ups or whatever they phrase it, just to validate, is it actually interesting for other people? I check the comments out because in case someone's calling bullshit on something, I don't wanna then post something that then people then say is bullshit for me. But if people like this thing, then hopefully other people find it helpful as well. So grab some links, share it on LinkedIn. I talk about collaboration. So tagging in the person who actually authored the post, the research as well, because it will help hopefully help them as well, because more people that know them, it might help. And again, you never know. And it was really weird that my friend messaged me out the blue to say that that post you shared, I used that tool and I used it on an engagement. So it's really cool. But essentially you can just do that. Google hacking news. There's just, the stuff is out there. You just need to use it. And then things like a conference is a really good opportunity. So I spoke about a CISO that I mentioned earlier. So I feel like his LinkedIn profile didn't do him justice. So he had about 1700 followers. This guy is really good at what he does. He work, he's worked for respected businesses. He does a lot of stuff in the community. He doesn't put himself out there enough. And essentially he wants to have more things come to him. So. He spoke at an AWS event in, I can't remember, somewhere in, in Asia recently. And he only had one post about it. But I said to him, you can do three, four posts on that one thing because you could have, like leading up to it, you could have a post 
Uh, really looking forward to speaking at the, this conference in two weeks' time. Then a week before the conference, can't wait to attend this conference and watch this presenter speak. At the conference, you could take a photo, doesn't have to be a selfie, it could be literally a photo of a room or the signage or whatever, just to say, basically, I was at this conference. And then another post after of basically sharing insights of what you learned from the conference as well. So just that one event, you could do three, four posts. And if you go to a few conferences a year, then that's suddenly a number of your posts without even thinking about it. Um, and blogs as well. Some people I find don't do themselves justice. They'll have research blogs. They're doing really interesting stuff, but not enough people see it. So it's one thing for you to create your blog, have it out there. <clears throat> and your research blog could literally be your, your journey of um, doing Hack the Box or Pen Test the Lab, or it could be whatever it may be. But you could then take those posts and then put it on LinkedIn as well, or put it on Twitter. So again, hopefully more people see essentially the cool stuff you're up to and might get some value out of it as well. So in essence, if you post three to five times a week, which sounds a lot if you don't post at all, it can feel a lot. But if you go through the sort of advice that I said, it's not hard. Literally dedicate an hour to Googling some news in cybersecurity. There's two, two three posts. Add connections. So if you're consistent with building applications, sorry, applications, building your connections, and just, again, dedicating even half an hour or something a week to go, right, I want to build my, I want to say target market, but essentially your target audience or your connections, you just search LinkedIn for this type of person in your area even better, because hopefully you may even be able to meet up with some people. And a really good example of that is a friend of mine who I don't think he's here today, but he's he's somewhere in Vegas. He's over from Australia. He's pretty senior at the company he works at. About five, six years ago, he was told by a recruiter it's going to take him five years to become a pen tester. And he, he said, well, bullshit, I'm going to get there quicker than that. So where he lived, he basically went to the local meetups, connected with many, as many pen testers as he could, and then basically started taking him for coffees, for beers, I'm not recommending that because I don't want to give you advice and then you meet the wrong person and life goes wrong. But I'll just say this is what he did. Um, he met lots of pen testers and he basically found out what do you do in your job? What skills do you use? He went, basically understood what was that skills gap. Then he realized that not just the skills gap, but he also realized what value he could bring as well. So there is a a typical thing, um, unfortunately, for maybe a lot of technical roles that sometimes the communication skills or customer facing or sales side sort of balances the other way. And he realized that from his experience working as a developer, working as an architect, he had lots of customer facing experience. He could talk to customers, engage customers. He could do scoping. He could do things that a lot of pen testers basically just didn't want to do. So when he landed his first job, it wasn't entry level. He got the first job as, as a senior consultant because essentially he could demonstrate to the organization the value he could bring. And this is really important for everyone to try and bear in mind, especially for those early in their career. Often you're not starting at zero. You have something to offer. You just need to work out what it is. So where is, what is the thing? I mean, this goes back to problem solving. He identified that in his capacity as a pen tester, the other pen testers couldn't scope, couldn't manage the customer, couldn't manage the engagement. They just wanted to hack shit. But he could do that. And because he could offer that, the company saw value. So he got the senior role, he got a decent salary. Now he's put in a position where he's moved on from that business, working for a billion dollar tech company, uh, managed over 50 people, and is on a really decent career trajectory. And it was only five, six years ago, he was told by a recruiter it would take him five years to become a pen tester. So one, don't believe recruiters, which negates this whole topic, because um, most recruiters don't know shit. <laughs> but there's a lot of things you can do, so please remember that you have something to offer, you just need to work out what it is. And this goes for folks that have never worked in IT before. So things to bear in mind is in cybersecurity, yes, it's basically a technical industry, but you don't, things don't happen if you can't communicate, if you can't influence. And it doesn't matter if you're a pen tester who's basically hacking shit, because if your report is garbage and that doesn't influence change in your customer or your company, then you could be the best hacker in the world.
But if you're if you can't write a report that influences change that has actually impact in the business, then you're no good. You could be an average pen tester, but fantastic at writing reports. You actually make a difference. So there's lots of things out there where there's people that come from hospitality backgrounds, working in retail, your customer facing skills, working under pressure, like there are some really good people out there, for example, that have worked in the kitchens, working as a chef, working as a cook. Like if you work in a sock, you know, that's very transferable there. Yes, it's not technical, but you can work under pressure. So again, it's knowing how to extract this role here and the similarities. Um, so again, I've gone off topic a little bit here, but I think it's really important that you, ha for most people, you have something to offer. You just need to work out what it is. But essentially, you need to build out those connections in the first place to understand what is, what is the skills gap, what is the experience gap, but also what you can bring to the table as well. And then repeat. So I'm just gonna show you an example I'm desperate to try and get that to 41337. So if anyone wants to follow me, you're very welcome to. Um, so just like resumes, this is, an, this is an opinion. So what I say is not fact, it's just my opinion that works for me and works for some other people too. First of all is LinkedIn recommends that you complete these, I think seven steps or nine steps, whatever it is for an all-star profile. Follow the advice. Don't follow the advice about giving your passport details to verify your profile. Like, no, I'm not giving that company that information, but essentially just fill in the gaps for the other stuff. So here I've got a, a headline, they call it. So when someone searches something on LinkedIn, um, essentially they'll see like my profile, they'll see the headline. So straight away people hopefully understands that I recruit in cybersecurity and I'm involved in the community. Like that's, I'm happy people knowing that and if they're interested, they'll look at my profile. Then you've got the about section. This is, think of LinkedIn as your online CV. I know people that put, put more effort into their resume than their LinkedIn profile. The reality is there are way more people that are gonna see your LinkedIn profile that will ever see your resume. So either transport, transfer the information over, or just put more effort into your LinkedIn profile. So quickly, if someone just looks at my profile, they'll see that I run Cyberset People, we're a recruitment business. Um, they'll see that I've done a bunch of industry stuff and that I'm passionate about neurodiversity. Those are the key highlights. So if they like it, they'll, they'll continue. Then you've got your posts. Um, I said recently, like again, I'm a bit sporadic with my posts. I've posted I think three times in the last week, but here's a post in this conference. I like to mix it up. I love memes and just creating them. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but um, I just try and add a bit of humor. Um, no offense to students out there, I'm sorry. Um, and then I post the odd job post as well. Um, but I'm not a recruiter that's just posting job post, job post, job posts. I'm trying to offer value, you might recognize that. Um, so there's my sort of two, three posts about the conference and then upcoming stuff. But again, I'm a recruiter, we, we're working jobs with customers, but hardly any of my posts or one in five, one in seven are actually about jobs. So again, I like to share insights, I like to share advice. Because um, if I'm honest with you, people get more value out of that stuff than the odd job placement. And then you've got your job stuff. So I'll hold my hand up here. I haven't done a great job of it. Mine's pretty nothing. Like that is literally a description of my, my job. I've been running this business for over seven years now, but it's quite self-explanatory. But you can do this in your job. Again, think of it like your CV. You would write what you do in your job um, because ultimately the more information you have, the more people are gonna find you. And just to sort of reiterate what I said earlier about connection requests, I can't accept any more connections. I've, I've nearly tapped out because LinkedIn, I think it's 30,000 connections they allow you to have. Um, and I'm sorry for any people here that I'm sort of sharing names and stuff, but if I just scan through this, they'll see one thing here, but the rest, 
like it's I'd say less than five percent of people actually write anything. And normally, when I could accept LinkedIn requests, I was a lot more inclined to accept the ones with messages. Um, so again, if I were you, I'd be adding a, a just a simple message, um, essentially to connect with people and, and why you'd like to connect. And talking of connecting, I'd like this to connect. There we go. <coughs> so resumes, um, but honestly, resumes. No one likes them. No one likes to read them. Um, we're in this this holding pattern until something changes. If I'm honest, I've got, it's where I think LinkedIn's pretty helpful because ultimately, I, I actually don't disagree with this stat and it's a really horrible thing to say out loud. Um, but I don't read CVs. Um, I, no offense, but I'm not interested. Um, what I am interested in is scanning your CV for certain data points. So I want to see your job titles. I want to see where you've worked. I want to see the how long you've worked in organizations. Hopefully you've got some stuff in there on what you actually did, not the activities, but what problems you solved, what, what difference you made to a business. And then maybe some sort of technical stuff, if you have technical skills in the profile. That's enough. Ultimately, most people are not very good at selling themselves. We're not taught how to sell ourselves. But this can be really helpful where, again, I'm just scanning something because I'm more interested in getting to know the human behind the resume. So no hiring manager. If a, com if a company advertises a job and someone showed me yesterday, they had 300 and approximately 370 applications for a job. No one's reading that. Like if it takes, let's pretend two, three minutes to go through that, like you're talking close to a thousand minutes, seven, eight hundred thousand minutes to go through the resumes then get back to every single person like it's challenging and recruiters get a bad rep and if I'm honest I think that's right most of the time um, you can still respond to people and say they're not successful because at least it gives people closure but ultimately looking at LinkedIn looking at a resume I'm just scanning for data points so again it's about the right information um, so I talk about this, then I talk about the importance of what information to actually put on there. But essentially, we don't like writing them, people don't like reading them, and it's, it, it sucks. Um, the truth is, keywords do matter. Um, there's certain things on a resume, and again, this is just opinions, because I, I shared, and I'll share with you as well, an example resume. Um, how are we doing for time, by the way? How are we doing for time? That's okay. Um, so keywords do matter, and it's about the right information. So I'm just realizing I've got 13 minutes and a bit more to get through, so I'll, I'll rush. But essentially, there is no excuse if, excuses for certain things. Poor formatting on a CV in terms of like grammar and stuff like that, there's just no excuse. With the tools that we have out there, spell check and Grammarly and whatever, like. What really makes me laugh is when you see attention to detail on, as a skill on someone's CV and then they've not spelt certain words correct. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, being too vague, generic. Um, people don't, this is a tough one, tailoring your application to a job. But essentially, if you can see what they're hiring for, then you can tailor it, but you tailor only small parts. Like you only need to do a few little bits. Um, you don't have the important information in there and too many pages is a real bug there. So some people say one page, some people two pages. I won't pretend there's like a magic number. I'll only say there's, there's just too much is the wrong thing. So what happens with most people is they don't start from scratch. They'll have a resume they've had for years. Then they either need a new job or they want to get a new job. So then they update their resume. So they've already got this four or five page resume. Now they add their new or their latest job on there and they just keep adding, adding, adding. And now, now we've got six, seven, eight page resumes. And the truth is no one's reading that. So resume writing is a skill. Personally, I don't think you need to pay someone to do it. I know, I know there are people out there that do it. And if there's an, anyone in this room, no offense, but maybe you are good at what you do. But there's too many times where I've seen resumes from people that have paid a lot of money and it's bullshit 
Um, they could have saved money and just done it themselves with just advice, in my opinion. Um, these are some of the most nauseous creating words I see on CVs. Like, it's different if you can back up things, but if you just put, um, you know, in terms of your soft skills or skills that you're a team player, you are passionate, you're innovative, well, validate that, back it up with examples. But essentially, they're just, they're just words, and you need to be really careful. Again, resume writing is a skill, and if you can demonstrate the ability to articulate very concisely, you're showing another skill set as well, again, which is really important in an industry where you're trying to communicate, you're trying to influence other people to make decisions. So if possible, I'd say like take some of this stuff off because it just, it's just words. It, mean, it means nothing, in my opinion. Some of the most important things you can do is outcomes. So a lot of people, their resume will look like they've just copied and pasted a job description of just list of responsibilities. The reality is a job, jobs in different businesses look the same. If you're a level two SOC analyst in one company, chances are level two SOC analyst bar a couple of things is very similar. Same as pen tester over here, pen tester over here. But if you talk about the actual outcomes you delivered, the difference that you made, it's a weird analogy, but if you imagine you have a twin, you both go through the same education, you then go and work at different places, but you're both working in the same job you have different experiences depending on where you work. And it's the difference that you personally made, the impact that you made, and when you can convert that into metrics, again, you're showing yourself up here to compare to most people. So I'll see on a CV for someone who's like, who was working in the SOC, managed to respond to security incidents. Well, yeah, no shit, that's the job. But what did you actually do? And when you can basically break it down to something like this, where you reduced downtime or you reduced different things or you showed saving money, you're showing that you have a real impact on the business itself. This is what most pen testers resumes look like, is it will say pen tester, company, the time they work there, and they'll just list web apps, mobile apps, and code review or something like that. And again, no shit, that's the job. You, you hacked stuff, well done. But what did you actually do? What difference did you make for your, for your customer or other, or other organizations? And again, if you can show saving time, saving money, reducing things, again, you're showing real impact to the organization itself. A takeaway really about resumes, like if going through all of that, for me, trying to condense it down, if you can demonstrate these things, then you're doing a better job than most people, in my opinion. You focus on the, like if your resume is three, four pages, it doesn't matter, it's fine. Um, but if you can just, again, demonstrate outcomes, achievements, making a difference that you made, that's it. That's, that's you're honestly above 95% of most people because most people don't do that. Here's an example CV. Some people might not like this and that's perfectly okay. But in this scenario, I'm a level two SOC analyst and I want to step into more of a level three type role. I'll try and zoom in. So a bit like LinkedIn, I've got my sort of headline where I'm doing basically that's the role. Different scenario here, but I'm putting I'm an Australian citizen. What that does do, that basically says to a potential employer, you don't have to worry about working rights. I can work here. Obviously that needs to be validated, but essentially that stops a lot of applications because a lot of applicants don't have working rights and essentially unfortunately a lot of organizations may not be able to hire someone that needs sponsorship um location i don't put my address i put basically the city or state that i'm in a company does not need to know your address if you think about your resume chances are at some point it's going to get leaked somewhere so think about what information you want leaked from your resume um, real scary thing is I've had resumes from people from overseas and they've had their passport details, they've had their, their parents' passport details. I don't know what the thinking behind that is, um, but that person apparently works in security. Um, sorry, go figure. 
Um, I'm very conscious of time, so I'll try and uh, get through this without over overdoing it. But essentially, I've got my profile here. I talk about who I am, what I do, and what I'm looking to do next. Um, I talk. I have skills on there. So this is. I did actually share this on LinkedIn, and some people gave different feedback. And again, that's okay. But I'm thinking about my perspective as a recruiter. I'm searching for keywords. I'm searching for certain data points. And if I see certain information in terms of the key skills, um, you know, certain technologies, I'm interested. For example, if I see a, a level two SOC analyst with good Python skills and instant response, I want to talk to that person. Like, it's as simple as that. Um, again, some, some companies will hire very sort of um, high people because of their certain vendor skills. Uh, the reality is, and I forget the, the recent headlines, but a lot of companies will look for people with CrowdStrike skills because they're already using it in their environment and they might not need to then train that person up. So that can be helpful. In this job here, I'm not listing my, my responsibilities because ultimately I'm expecting this, person, this job to, to be reviewed by someone who knows what they're doing. It's not always the case, but I'm hoping they know what they're doing. They know what a level two SOC analyst does, so I've just got a high overview there. But then I'm talking about the key achievements, where I've made a difference. Same again, I'm not listing all the stuff that I do in my job because ultimately that's just the job itself, that's just the activities. But again, where I'm making a difference. Um, I like to put this on here. What was interesting is some people didn't, didn't think this makes sense in terms of conferences and meetups. Personally, if I see someone's resume and they're going to black, uh, besides Las Vegas, they've gone to DEF CON, I'm thinking, well, okay, well, you're, you're my sort of people. Um, you invest, potentially you're investing your own time and your own money for yourself. That tells me you give a shit about your job, your career, and you're actually interested. There'll be certain conferences that happen that are, that are more corporate. And that, I know this is during the week. I'm on Australian time zone, I forget what day is. Um, but there'll be some conferences that are on a Tuesday and Wednesday and it's more formal, it's all suits, and it's basically people are there because they have to be there. A lot of community conferences tend to happen at weekends, and that's where essentially people demonstrate they're there because they want to be there. Um, you know, when people give out their own time and their own money, that's, that tells you they care. And again, if you put it on a resume, certain people will resonate a lot with that. So that is that part, and The question is, are we going to get to finish this presentation in time? Well, here's the good news. Since you're the next presenter also, <laughs> I was thinking uh, we could 120 more seconds. And then if you have questions, this panel includes him and you can ask him questions during the panel because it's going to be interactive. Does that work for everybody? All right. No choice. It works anyway. <laughs> This is, okay, I'm gonna try and do this quickly. This is one of the most important things I think in this presentation. Basically live job hunting. Um, can someone give me a job title and a location? Anyone? Threat Detection Engineer, Plano, Texas. Threat Detection Engineer, Texas. Okay, so let's pretend I want this job. I'm gonna go on, I, I don't know the best job board in the US, but if we, I know Indeed, let's just go with Indeed. So, let's just go Texas, but, ah, uh, okay. Yes, I'm a human. At least it's doing its thing. All right. So let's just pretend this role here. It's the first one. So uh, threat detection engineer, Macquarie Group in Houston. So I'm going to take the company name. I'm going to go on LinkedIn. If I can go on LinkedIn. I'm going to search the company name. So we go Macquarie. Actually, an Australian business. Um, I'm going to all the employees and let's just put in threat detection. Four people. 
Are any of these the manager? Maybe not. The job title might, so the job might say who it reports into. Sometimes they do. So our global threat and incident response team. Uh, okay, so let's just go cyber threat then. Right, six people. Okay, I'm gonna say it's not any of these. I don't have the time to go deeper, but let's just pretend it's uh, Samuel. That's a joke because he's a graduate. Let's just pretend it's Samuel. I would then, I'd go through the process. I would apply online for the job, but I would then send Samuel a message and say, hey Samuel, I'm not being demanding or anything like that. I'm just saying, hey Samuel, um, I saw the role for threat detection engineer. Um, looks awesome. I feel like I can add some value. I did apply for the role. Let me know if you've got any questions. Right, just really simple. All you're doing is flagging that I'm interested in the job. Now, if you've got a good LinkedIn profile, this way you build your profile in the first place is then they look at your profile and go, oh, this person's really interesting. They might be what we're looking for. Then they tell HR or talent acquisition, reach out to them and organize an interview. Basically, you're trying to bypass HR. You could do the same thing with talent acquisition, but essentially you want to go to the person with the problem because they know more what they're looking for than talent acquisition or HR. Um, I don't have time to go deeper, but um, hopefully that helps. And if you want any, any questions or reach out after, then please do so. Um, in the meantime, thank you for being here.